as Amy said, I'm from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, with the Corps of Engineers there, and uh, I don't get to come out here too often, although our headquarters is located not too far from this facility here. But I think we're all dealing with the same thing. It's tight budgets and uh, trying to put an emphasis on everything that you need to put an emphasis on is really difficult for all of us. And uh, when I flew out here yesterday, it was su such a nice day, I thought I'd uh, become a tourist and uh, walk around a lot and put on too many miles uh, walking yesterday. But as I came down through Constitution Avenue, I thought, look at all the remarkable levees, berms, and flood walls. And then I thought about it, and as Paul mentioned, those weren't uh, flood walls for flooding. That's uh, terrorist activity. So a lot of times our Congress responds to uh, things a little bit slower than our individual needs are. So maybe back after the uh, federal building was bombed in Oklahoma City some years ago is when we started putting in these uh, security measures. And Paul's right. A, a lot of these look like they could double uh, for flood protection. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind <clears throat> as we move forward with our tight budgets. If you're focusing on one item, make sure that you can uh, bring in enough people to look at something innovative and make sure that we could be creative and uh, cover maybe a couple uh, uh, needs for those. I'm gonna talk a little bit. I'm just gonna go through a lot of things. Some of it's gonna be uh, uh, applicable to uh, what you do and some of it may not be, but uh, uh, if you live in a home, an apartment, or if you work in a facility that's in a floodplain, this is something that you should all keep uh, in mind of. But anyhow, the government now looks at uh, risk. They look at the initial risk and um, uh, how we can step down to a, a smaller risk for everybody, and it, whether that's through zoning, building codes, outreach, uh, kind of like what we're doing today is a little bit of an outreach just to make this uh, an awareness in, uh, to everybody. Evacuation planning, evacuation planning not only for people, but maybe for your uh, artifacts and your collections that you have also. Uh, there could be structural or non-structural uh, risk reduction measures. There can be insurance. And then what you're gonna do eventually is work down to a, uh, a minimum uh, flood risk, residual risk here that you can uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm gonna talk to, uh, a few minutes about common non-structural measures, elevation, wet flood proofing, dry flood proofing, berms, barriers, and flood walls, relocation, acquisition, the same thing as buyouts, uh, flood warning, emergency evacuation plans, and flood insurance. And again, we're talking critical facilities, and with a critical facility, they should incorporate a higher level of protection. In fact, a um, number of studies have been going on across the United States, probably uh, directed by Congress uh, through a lot of our agencies, and out of all the natural disasters that hit the United States annually, the one that causes the most damage is flooding. We spend more fu uh, funding annually on preventing floods than any of the other natural disasters uh, combined, and yet we're losing that war against flooding. And whether it's a, if you think it's a climate change or, or maybe uh, poor choices for economic development by locating in high hazard areas, this country is losing the war on uh, flooding and the damages that are the result of flooding. Uh, elevation, there's, uh, and you know, I don't think we're gonna see the National Archives elevated like this anytime soon, but uh, this is just something to keep in mind. In fact, if, if you ever uh, travel the coastal area, you see an awful lot of structures that are on columns and piers to allow that wave action to flow through there if there's uh, a hurricane type of uh, situation. You can elevate on extended foundations. You can elevate on fill. And we're probably looking at about three different types of flooding. And, and when you focus on one, you may get hit with another one. So if you're focusing on uh, riverine flooding here, and we know the Corps of Engineers out of the Baltimore district is uh, looking at some levees and closure structures, and you think, wow, that's gonna take care of all of our flooding. And as someone asked earlier, what's that gonna do to our floodplain maps? It may shrink it a little bit, but it appears to me that there's a problem in this area that you have uh, interior drainage or interior ponding. So what you need to do is look at your elevation, look at all the data. While you might not get flooded in the future from the river, you may have a hurricane event that's gonna dump a lot of water like it did back in June of 2006. And if it does that, then you're gonna get flooded, maybe just as bad as if the river were to get you. When we talk about wet flood pruning, Proofing also, there are certain things that you can do. You see an example here, a uh, lower area, and this could be something like this auditorium here with, uh, in this example, it's a house with utilities in the basement. They've been elevated up to the top and you're 
through the structure itself, there's uh, openings to let the water flow in and out of there, not into an area that's going to uh, affect uh, the mechanical electrical systems, but an area where the walls uh, are going to equalize with the water on the outside of the structure and the water on the inside so that you don't have a uh, uh, disproportionate uh, amount of uh, force from the outside caving in the walls on that structure. Also, and I think Lois and Henry may have mentioned this, a lot of things that we've done in the upper Midwest is uh, take uh, basement areas and maybe fill those in completely, cap them off with concrete, and then we've gone and built uh, above ground in addition that replaces that uh, storage area or that uh, basement facility. So that's something that you could probably look at if you're dealing with an area that is uh, uh, in a high-risk area. Dry flood proofing, what we're trying to do there with the envelope of that structure is to uh, keep the water out of it, and there's a number of ways of doing that, uh, all kinds of applications. Generally, we look at a flood depth of three to four feet or less. On your buildings that uh, I see coming down, uh, the, the federal buildings that we have in this area here, the walls look like they're at least three or four feet thick, so I'm sure you can take on more water than that. But you want to make sure that you have a structurally sound building. Uh, a lot of times this works with new construction, but you can retrofit it for existing buildings, and we saw that this morning with the uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, what I have here is just a couple of photos where uh, this is actually over in Hawaii. Uh, University of Hawaii was uh, dealt a heavy blow a few years ago with a major flood event. University Library and uh, destroyed all kinds of probably uh, collections of uh, books that they had over there. Since then, instead of uh, completely relocating, they've done some structural things with the river itself that caused the problem, but then here on some of their buildings that happen to be in that flood threat area, they've gone ahead and applied some non-structural uh, flood proofing material so that the uh, water, if this happens again, cannot get into the building. And from the exterior, you'll see that they can uh, make that look uh, pretty nice. It's just not something uh, with glues and and concrete, you know, they, they can landscape it and everything, and it does come up looking pretty nice then. Uh, dry flood proofing, like I'm saying, it's just a way of uh, completing, uh, keeping the envelope of the structure completely uh, closed, uh, barriers on openings, make sure that for uh, sewer lines, stormwater systems, you have a one-way valve so that you cannot get flooding internally. And something you should also look at, too, is uh, possibly redundancy in, in things that you do. I know if you put berms, small flood walls, uh, if water still does in infiltrate either through uh, the sewer system or something else, you should probably consider tow drains, interior tow drains, maybe pump systems uh, in areas that uh, you can maintain, uh, uh, keep ahead of the, where the water may come in and so forth. Here we have an example again of a uh, uh, Smithsonian uh, Pizza Hut, one of the first Pizza Huts uh, constructed, probably not. This is in uh, uh, West Virginia, and this structure um, was something that the city council, through their meetings, and I think a lot of times uh, decisions are made at the local level about where, uh, how we use the land and everything, but unfortunately, because they're looking at development to come into a community, they're looking at the jobs that it may bring in, it might not be the wisest choices uh, sometimes. And then this example here, uh, a Pizza Hut was located into a high hazard floodplain area, and it suffered a number of times, but the owners and the community did not, did not want to give up on it. But what they did, because the general flood uh, flooding that uh, hampered this business were relatively uh, low depth, they went ahead and put an exterior uh, layer of uh, uh, non-impermeable uh, sealant, and then they put a layer of brick facing over that so that it looks uh, just about like the original structure itself. There's things that you can do. I, I noticed walking around here yesterday, there were a number of structures that appear to be built below ground surface level, whether they have a moat uh, between them and the land uh, or the ground, or if it's just coming down from a berm. But it looked to me like if that was regular glass, that water could permeate in either around the frame or maybe destroy the uh, glass itself. Uh, here in this example, it's a, um, a facility that used bulletproof glass, water-resistant frames and so forth. So for the flooding, uh, the water did not get, get in. Other techniques that we've seen that are just temporary measures are a uh, kind of like a water-resistant tart material that you can actually uh, prepare around the foundation of a facility 
and just pull this up and there would be hooks that you could place this on hooks. Just a temporary measure to keep the water out of that facility. I don't imagine that you would do this with any of your large structures, but if you had any smaller sheds or any other structures, maybe made of brick or wood on your uh, properties, this is something that you may want to consider. Again, uh, berms, barriers, and flood walls, uh, anything that you can do to keep the water out. Uh, generally, I say try to protect yourself to the highest level of uh, protection as possible, but anything you do you know, is an improvement. If, uh, if you have berms and uh, flood walls, make sure from interior drainage that comes that you don't drown yourself because water gets in from rainfall in here and gets into the building. You, you want to make sure that you have some type of uh, a system to pump that water out. Looking at a few examples of uh, the berms and barriers, and uh, sometimes they are uh, uh, landscaped and everything really nice. Uh, all you'd have to do is put a barrier here for this larger uh, facility. They've got an earthen berm that goes around the facility, and then they key in a uh, flood wall and a barrier would go right there. A lot of times you see manually and uh, operated systems, and sometimes they're uh, automatic systems. Uh, there are uh, flood gates, and I, I think through some of the structures I saw uh, yesterday in this area, there are a number of flood gates. This would be a manual one that there's a, uh, a flood wall, but this would roll into operation and uh, keep the water out. And I've, I've actually seen this one in operation with about two foot of water on it and it works very well. You can see an entryway into a building here, and here's a, um, a flood uh, barrier that would be closed uh, to keep the flood waters out. Uh, hydraulic gate closures, these uh, rely on, and I think I saw on the west side of this building here, something very similar where uh, water, as it comes up, goes into the system, and it would uh, automatically, without human intervention, you wouldn't have to have a person put a gate in, but the gate would come up on its own. I have uh, a couple of handouts that I have out uh, front there, and, and one of them that I, I'd, I'd like you to take a look at, or when you leave, at least uh, get a copy of this. This is just a, a handy little pocket tool for uh, planning uh, uh, non-structural measures, and what it does is look at, uh, across the top of it, a number of, um, of the measures that I've talked about here, elevation on foundation walls all the way down to uh, flood insurance. And down the left side, it talks about uh, the flood characteristics. And I really feel there's two data sets that you really have to be aware of. One is your flood characteristics. Are, we, you, know, are you looking at high velocity, low velocity, uh, the duration? If, if you're talking about a, a reservoir, like a ponding area, how long is that water going to be in that ponding area? Is it going to infiltrate to the ground or any materials into your structure? Uh, also looking at site characteristics. Uh, building characteristics, and then we even get down into uh, looking at some other uh, social characteristics. And the idea is to look at uh, the characteristics of the flood, and then everywhere um, you see a Y, that's a yes, ends no, and uh, let's say, for instance, uh, shallow flooding, that first row um, across, you would see a yes for elevation on foundation walls, that, that would be applicable. So you work your way down picking out what your characteristics are, the flood, the building, materials, and so forth. And every time you see a Y, you add that up. And if you're looking at some other type of non-structural measure, compare that to the number of Ys you come up with that column. And uh, the one that generally has the most number of Ys gets the, the win on this. If it's a no, it's, if it's a letter N, we're just recommending that you don't use that type of uh, procedure for uh, flood protection. But it's just a, a quick tool, it's a, it's a handy tool uh, to look at. Another item I had out on the table there is uh, a two-page description of non-structural measures. Uh, generally, everything we talk, you know, if, if we're talking elevation or filling in basements, wet flood proofing, that may mean uh, one thing to one person or agency and different to another person in agency, but generally with the Corps of Engineer, Engineers, uh, these are the definitions that we're working with. Uh, like I said, there's a couple data sets looking at the flood characteristics, always know what the depth, velocity, and duration is, uh, then looking at the land use, the structure inventory uh, data. Uh, it's nice to know the location. So much of this information can go into databases now that are uh, uh, 
uh, can incorporate GIS layers and so forth. And if you're working with FEMA's uh, floodplain maps, they have the hydraulic river stationing or so forth on it. It's really nice. You can build a database if you're looking at more than one structure. And I think one thing you probably have to be careful about in an area when you're working uh, with separate structures, if uh, one uh, person, uh, a property owner across the street is doing one thing with his property to prevent flooding, make sure you know what that is that they're doing over there so whatever whatever happens during the next flood event, they don't induce damages on you. So you want to make sure if they're uh, uh, coming out right to the street's edge and they're uh, building uh, six foot high flood walls or something to, uh, to prevent any type of water getting on their property, that that water's not going to end up over on yours. So generally you want to look at your own specific structure, but I think with all the federal agencies in this area, you need to be aware as a group of what everybody's doing. Uh, you, you need to know what the first floor elevations are, what your basement floor elevation is. I don't know if this auditorium was wet in 2006, but it's something that you should consider. You know, this is a, a very useful uh, facility right here, and you don't want it damaged, so you really need to know not only the first floor, but uh, basement elevations. If you have tunnels, corridors that connect buildings, you want to make sure you know the elevations of those, and are they secure? Are they watertight? There are uh, a number of vendors out there that... Uh, do design and sell um, uh, flood closure doors, panels for tunnels and corridors, and that's something that you want to consider. Uh, you want to look at the construction material, uh, building characteristics. You want to look at the size of the building, the length of the perimeter, the openings, the windows, and the utilities. A lot of times people feel like they've got their structure pretty well buttoned up, and then they forget that uh, once the flood occurs, the water can come in through uh, mechanical and electrical conduit systems and cause a lot of disruption to their uh, facility through that. Uh, you want to look at site plan, uh, spacing between the structures and the landscaping and so forth. Then for us within the Corps of Engineers, we, we're always looking because we're working with communities, we're looking at the structure value because we have to develop uh, a cost estimate and make sure that it's a uh, feasible project that we're looking at implementing. So we'll compare within a community of uh, a structural means, maybe uh, levees, reservoirs, channel improvements versus elevation, uh, flood walls, and small berms like that. And we have to go with the, uh, the uh, alternative that has the uh, highest benefit cost ratio. And it's probably something that you may want to look at internally with your own annual budget. If you're looking at trying to do something that uh, maybe costs $400 million versus uh, the same results you could get for a $100 million project, I think the taxpayers would appreciate it all, you know, if we all chose the one that's going to get us the same results but at the uh, lesser cost. Uh, vulnerability assessments, as Paul mentioned, uh, you want to develop the hydraulic information, uh, determine what the significant runoff events are, determine uh, the hydraulic data for uh, the flood events, what are the stages. Just because in 2006 you had a stage of 11, doesn't mean that you're not going to see a 13 or a 15 occur. So uh, generally when we're looking at implementing non-structural measures, the initial cost is the highest cost. If we're elevating something or we're putting a barrier around something, just to mobilize that company to get them on site that's going to do this work has the highest initial cost. If you want to elevate a structure, we always say if, if you're trying to elevate to the 100 year or the 500 year and you're going up three or four feet, why don't you add a couple more feet to that just to get it protected to maybe the 500 year. The same thing with a uh, 500 year uh, water resistant barrier around a uh, facility. That initial cost, you're gonna, you're gonna uh, eat that anyway. So why not look at seeing what it would cost just to get you that little bit extra level of protection. Um, the rest of this is just on the benefits. Uh, what we do a lot of times is just uh, go out, and this is just an example of another commercial structure. We'll take photos all the way around the structure, the four sides. We'll look at the hydrology and the hydraulics, make sure that they're current. That's one thing that changes with time, and I think someone said your previous uh, floodplain maps were done back in 1985, so I'm sure this 2011, they're going to look a little bit different, particularly if you had a large event in 2006. So I always want to make sure that you're using the most uh, current H&H uh, &H data, but generally we'll go and uh, look at uh, the flood event, two year, five, 10, 25, 50, 100, even the 500 year on critical facilities. 
look at the ground elevations and then look at the first floor elevations and that depth of water. And we just try to work through this. It's just kind of a tool for out in the field where you're looking at your vulnerabilities. You know, where's the water going to get into your uh, structure? This is a website uh, for, I'm, I'm the chairman of the CORE's uh, National Non-Structural Flood Proofing Committee. This is a website where we have all of our uh, documents provided. And there's even an email in there that you can uh, get to us. There's uh, seven full-time members that are located across the country here. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can email them to us. And I also have my uh, direct telephone line there and email address if you have any questions uh, that way. Yes, my name is Stacy Underwood. As Randy said, I'm with the uh, Baltimore District of the Army Corps of Engineers, and the District of Columbia is within our area of responsibility. So I just have one slide for you today. I just wanted to make you aware of the uh, Corps' uh, capabilities as, um, with regards to flood risk management. Um, you know, not only do we have access to Randy and his great team of, of experts that, that can do all the non-structural uh, design work and evaluation, uh, we have other professionals that can do various types of studies, flood vulnerability assessments, um, any flood stormwater related analyses, studies, um, can look at various types of alternatives, evaluate, compare them um, for both structural and non-structural. Um, not only can we study them, we can also design them and construct them and, and basically anything, you know, flood or water related, um, we have ca capability to do. Um, of course, if it is a federal agency, it would be uh, the funds would need to come from that federal agency for the work. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, you know that we have that capability. Uh, if, if anybody's interested, I guess my my name and phone numbers are listed on the back of the agenda. Um, but you know we can do something as small as having a team of experts come out and look at your facility for a few days and give you some uh, some advice on that to a much more detailed study, like I said, design, construction, and so forth. So that's it. That's all I had.